Hello and welcome to the first session of Hyper Annotations live from Venice with Nizal Adnan Yildiz uh, in the wonderful ocean space. And I have three questions for Adnan. And the first is, we are in Venice and a lot of the projects uh, this year and the past years are about ecology. And if you account for all the art world people who are coming from the whole world and spending a lot of gas and wasting in, 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 into the uh, environment, so to speak, how is the visibility of a project that deals about ecology, but it then ha has to be seen by a lot of people that have to waste a lot of uh, researchers, how does how do you see this impact? Um, good question, because I was lucky to be able to see Arsenal and Giardin in the last two days, a bit earlier during the preview. As much as you noticed art for art, you know, like this conceptual uh, art for art kind of, looking like art uh, kind of work, mostly rich people like it a lot. As much as we had that, I think you see a lot of gardens, the exhibition space are expanding, you see a lot of trends, like representation of this situation is there. It's almost like if you want to talk about identity politics or be politically correct, there are a lot of portraits from African people, like that sort of representation, but having a lot of portraits from uh, people of color are not going to make it better. It's just, again, the representation problem. And having a lot of plants, forests in the exhibitions are not going to make it better. It's an, again another representation problem. But I think philosophically it would be very interesting to think about art words, not art words, but art words as an ecology or ecologies too because the interesting thing becomes when uh, not only uh, representing the problems but also applying the theoretical approach. Betty, Donna Haraway, like applying it one to one because when you apply this on your existence, reality, and consciousness, of course, how you treat your body is very relevant with how you treat the space you live, how you treat the nature you are part of it, and how you engage with the ecology. So, I think art words should acknowledge the fact that it's an ecology too. We have a, a Talents and these conversations are important to hold on each other. So I think in order to deal with the ecology as a topic, it would be good to understand our situation as part of ecology too. Institutions, individuals, singularities, pluralities, like not only as a tema, not only as a motif, not only as a trendy topic, but also consciously being part of an ecology. What does it mean? Because you don't position the human existence at the center. Adnan, I know that you are very uh, familiar with the uh, artworks that deal with the Kurdish question. And we're in Venice, the place where every nation has a pavilion. Eurovision. So yeah, it's basically the Eurovision of art. And we had a Roma pavilion every odd year. What, how would you see uh, and, on the, and also envision a potential Kurdish pavilion? Or would you be against it? Patrick, you uh, asked a very good question. Because with a couple of friends, I always imagine a uh, what, like a Caribbean sort of style. Um, like, a, uh, like a kind of uh, both that we squat together, like, uh, and I would like to, you know, all these yachts, these which people come and then you see, okay, is it the, is it this one or that one? Like, uh, like I want to be a prey, like Pratan, <laughs> and I want to come close to the arsenal with this huge boat, and when the boat opens up, you could see the. Uh, Zaza, Kurmanji, all the language you hear 
from Kyrgyzstan. And you, you also see historically different positions, like uh, generationally. I would like to have uh, a board dedicated to Kyrgyzstan, and uh, the whole project would be about Memuzin, which is uh, the translator of Memuzin from Kurdish to Turkish says, uh, it's the first social realist text in history. And it's a very important document for Kurdish identity and language. So I, I always want the opportunity to, to have a board, put all the Kurdish artists, invite everyone, come close to Arsenai, open up it as a stage, read Memuzin together. I know a bit about Memuzin, but I think that some of our <coughs> viewers it's a love story. might not know it. Could you give us a short glimpse uh, into, uh, into that story, into that history? Uh, I mean, I can't because I'm not uh, an expert on Kurdish uh, literature and uh, history, but what I can do is, uh, it's an oral uh, history uh, reference. So. Also, considering the Kurdish and the Anatolian context, I think it will be very interesting to think about the oral history because a lot of things that are documented, written, and preserved have something to do with privilege of the alphabet, of the language, of the power, of the class, of the institution, of the government, of the state. So I'm always interested in the unspeakable. And then you think about what was not recorded, what was not preserved, and what was not written. And Memozin is in interesting because for very, very long years, from very different resources, this story survived as an oral historical uh, document. And how things change. I mean, Deng Beij or Derik, these are the ways of how literature exists in Kurdish culture and Anatolian culture. So. The spoken language is interesting because it lives. It doesn't uh, stop. It's almost like you put a piece into a museum and it's frozen in time. The piece doesn't change anymore. It's the same when you write it. It doesn't change anymore because it has the form. And oral history is not like that. It changes. It's a very singular, plural kind of thing. The individuals bring their insight perspective and mental space and I mean for me maybe the sky is not blue and in that story there's a possibility that the sky is not blue it's green today so I, I, I'm interested in the fact that uh, people can make contributions and these contributions change the story and I think looking at the Kurdish politics I don't think they share the same time uh, with Turks, because Turks at the moment got stuck in sort of Middle Ages, and the climate is very toxic. But when I'm spending time with Kurdish people, I'm not nationalist, or I think nation thing is kind of, you can project it into the future. It can become maybe a label. You go to a supermarket and you want to choose which shampoo you want. Maybe nation is not going to be this, uh, the local painting or 19th century kind of invention, but maybe it is going to be a brand, you know, it's going to be something else in, in the drama. But um, I'm, I'm feeling good with Kurdish people because uh, I think they share a different time. I had the same feeling in Bolivia with indigenous people, I had the same feeling with Maori people. I don't know what it is, otherwise, I, would, I wouldn't work on it. I'm trying to figure it out myself, so mostly we make exhibitions or work on things that we want to learn more or understand ourselves. So I don't know exactly, I cannot answer you, but from very young age, I grew up in a very pro-Kurdish environment, and I'm always with them since long time. I did solo exhibitions in my programs first time with Shener, with, uh, I worked with a lot of them, like Erkan James from Diyarbakir, so it's a kind of also genealogy that I feel belonging. I feel part of their practices. So in that sense, I think they share a different time. And this time zone, this perception of time, very interesting for me because, of course, you learn a lot of forms of resistance from them, politics of silence. These are important topics for them. Uh, but 
also the uh, the time they share I think they don't share the timeline so it's uh, I'm very interested with what you said about the politics of silence. Uh, uh, I <coughs> and my partner Mohammed were part of one of your projects, Modern Sona, and uh, we now know uh, from neurological research that language shapes the way uh, the paths in your brain uh, are built. So maybe it is language that uh, builds those societies. And since the societies you described, uh, Maori and, and Kurdish and so on, they still have an adherence at their original language, although they still speak English. But if we go and look at the international art world, there is only one lingua franca. And sometimes it is seen, uh, seen as nativist if you use your own language. Uh, uh, like German. Yeah, like German, if you have like a press release in, in English and German, or English and French, or English in Maori, whatever, it's seen sometimes as, as a kind of backwardness. Translating between uh, Maori and English is not the same between English and German or French, yeah. because that's also the language that was uh, not recorded in that time, but they retrieved it back. So. Uh, it's a ritual, it's a ceremony to find the epistemological correspondence of each thing. So, I don't. How, how can we see that as a uh, critically, and how can we transcend this uni uh, leveled uh, approach at, at, at understanding art that is always uh, been talked about only in one language, English? Uh, while on the second level, in order to uh, make it approachable for everyone, we still have to have one language. But we're not going to use an updated version of Esperanto. Do, have, do you have a solution for that? No, but there are some inspirations around and very good artists. If you see uh, Shouting Valley from Lawrence Abu Hamdan in Arsenal, it clearly defines the language, the act of speaking, shouting, or anything that you do with your mouth. Also, Dominic Gonzalez Hostel has a first VR piece here. It's a very beautiful piece. I think um, anything with speech, language, or how we move and communicate through our mouth and tongue, because I mean, I did Mutarzunga because. It is written in the 90s by a Turkish author in German. She got the first Ingeborg Bachmann Prize. As she got the Ingeborg Bachmann Prize first time as a foreigner. And it's four stories, very simple. But she draws a line between Arabic, Kurdish, and Turkish. No, Arabic, German, and Turkish. 30 years later, 20 years later, I draw Kurdish into this reality because, I mean, I would ask, uh, they ask in this uh, survey that I'm very much interested in to the Turkish people. Do you agree Turkish should be the second language in Germany? 84% said yes. They ask the same people. What about Kurdish as a second language in Turkey? Drops to 37. This is a kind of political double standards. I think language is still a very political space. It represents, and it has a lot of things with power, like sir, ma madam, ladies and gentlemen, like it defines still class race. So I think it will be very interesting to save language from the space of power, control, and hierarchy, and create a mental space that we can share all together, because it's a transgressive act to, to do anything with your tongue. Uh, because of your body, it's a kind of physical uh, reaction to the world, you speak up. So I think I would be very interested in searching, because I mean also in this biennial you see overproduction, overdesign, overreading, it's a lot now. I mean, we look for meaning, and when you look for meaning, 
language is there, like Wittgenstein, it maintains borders of your cognitive process. So maybe the future of creating lies not in the production of objects, but in the production of ideas. I was very lucky and privileged to be able to work as a director in Ottawa, in New Zealand, at Art Space in Auckland. When you live in an island, produce a program, you think three times, not two times. Because what stays with us after the exhibitions? And we really need to produce this. And I don't think curating in future or anything to do with, with art will be about production, but I think it will be more about mediation. And it will be more about, because we could also see how different sorts of spaces we are imagining, it will be more about sharing, because I think uh, I would like to quote Harari. Uh, think about colonialism. I mean, they could only measure your head to categorize you for which race you belong to. Now, they can put something in your body before you know it, they would know what's going on in your body. So you would be very thankful to the colonialism because it exploited you, but it still positioned you as a relevant subject. In future, you might lose your relevancy. So. I think curating should lead our people who want to curate, these rich kids who go to these curatorial schools and they do a couple of years study and they go out with business to it and they want to charge you immediately because they want the money back they invest. I think this is not going to happen because when you ask these people to return knowledge and experience uh, for the fee you pay, it's not fair. I mean, it should be an intellectual position. Let's remember Foucault, side. Like, this should be a position, like a generalist, that brings a lot of different abilities to create some change in thinking. And one thing that I was very happy in this year's Venice edition, I think Ralph Rolf is a very, uh, like, curatorial, curatorial mind. I mean, I, I'm, I can give you a lot of critics of the show, but what I liked was, now nobody takes this kind of things. He brings Ottobon with Suki, or like he, uh, he picks a couple of pieces from an installation from Ali Altman and puts next to Romilly Gonzalez Foster. He is really not afraid of bringing things together. I miss that sort of curatorial approach. I mean, since long time we are trying to get rid of this star male curator pioneers, and in between we tried several different positions, but this guy was not a star. He was working in an institution for long years and <coughs> made solo exhibitions. So still a male, still a kind of very, uh, um, I would say, uh, uh, a position that not so many people would maybe uh, be happy, but at the end, you would, you would see that dedication. And I was very happy that he's still cur curator, curator. He's a curator, curator, you know, he's still editing, bringing things together and uh, Create, trying to create conversations. So for me, curating in future should be about not being afraid of creating conversations that might create change. Because like language, if we speak up, things change. I deeply hope that the model of the blockbuster show will uh, shortly be eased out to uh, so we can explore other models that are not coming out of neoliberal uh, capitalist productions and then schematics where if you have that amount of uh, numbers of visitors, you have the better show than the other one that might be historically the important show. Uh, so it is quite interesting and I think we live in interesting times in a positive way. We say it's the same thing with the title. Yes. Because we, we are now able to produce new models for curation that ha would not have been possible uh, five or ten years fr from now because people in the heads of institutions are realizing that the blockbuster model is not going to make an impact. And 
that therefore uh, do you have a feeling like a prophetic feeling what could be a, such a new model could it be more social engagement could it be more production of that, ideas that could I escape from the institution for a break because for seven years I programmed the exhibitions and field space. Even try to be very critical about it, there was a program, there was an exhibition space, and there was an exhibition to be made all the time. And now, emancipating myself from transport, PR, administration, with the entire single project, I was very lucky in Berlin because I think in that small scale of programming for a year through different events popping up in town, I managed to see that the audience was left alone with the world. It was a very intimate relationship. One world in a non-profit space, very nice, intimate opening with friends, but I could see how they stay together without any of this PR, administration, transport, did you give a uh, uh, emailing to if with all these kind of things around it, the press release and to be a short paragraphs. And I think exhibition space is a cognitive space for me. And uh, I'm interested in this because if we are making exhibitions, if we are not using monitors or if we are not making books, it's not a kind of relationship. An exhibition space might be working in a space with your body and your bodily moves define your learning process. So, for me, it's a very cognitive space. I'm trying to figure out how the digital learning could match this bodily movement. So I think the first thought would be, ah, you have this QR code. You click and learn about the piece through your iPad and you see the exhibition. No, of course, because digital learning is a different processing than the learning we achieve through the exhibition because it has perception, recognition, Physicality included. So <coughs> I don't know the answer. I'm sorry, but I'm working on it. I decided to give a break with the institutions, and I decided to go back my PhD in architecture in Istanbul two hours years later. And my topic is how we imagine a space for future to make exhibitions. If we from white cube, if we remember black box. And if we see these green environments now, all these biennials are including like gardens and parks. Or think about Hito Shitaya's work, like it's green as a kind of room that the copy and paste figures that just render the space, a kind of augmented perception of green. What is the future uh, prospect of an exhibition space? So I think you cannot imagine this space without cognition, human cognition even not human cognition, even with alien intelligence, because why do we need to make exhibitions that are only for human beings? I was very lucky I worked with the guy from the knife, Olof. Once he was in Amazon and he made a song for an exhibition I curated from frogs, fish and birds, combining all these sounds from Amazon and making a check for the show to remember the show after the show. So. I think I would be very interested in creating a cognitive space to think about exhibitions and then we could share it with other sorts of intelligence that we can meet there and understand each other because uh, exhibiting means showing, exposing and I think that's the, that's the space like speaking up, just the conversation starts. Thanks Adnan. Thank you. It was amazing to have you, and dear viewers, uh, thank you, New Center for Research and Practice. So, and thanks to TBR 21 and Francesco von Habsburg.